Greetings to everyone. Um, this is our study group on spiritist psychology. And the topic that we're going to study tonight is structure and dynamics of the PCK. And I'd like to hand it over to Anai. Hello, everybody. Good night for all. So um, I just want to point out that this is a collaborative um, study group. We are going to be exchanging thoughts. I'll, I will have the PowerPoint now. Let's see, just uh, share with you. And OK, we are going to record until the end of the, the PowerPoint. And then we will stop the recording and be talking and exchanging ideas. So. Let me just share here. Is that everything okay, Fabrizio? Yeah, we can see perfectly. Okay. So we are going to be talking, it's actually an introduction about the structure and dynamics of the psyche. Very interesting topic. So in Memories, Dreams, Reflections is uh, Jung's autobiography. He says, in the, uh, um, he starts uh, saying this, my life is a story of the self-realization of the unconscious. Everything in the unconscious seeks outward manifestation. And the personality, too, desires to evolve out of its unconscious conditions and to experience itself as a whole. I cannot employ the language of science. Just one second. We, we have somebody. It's a nice voice. It's a child. <laughs> Maybe it's a synchronicity. So I think I would like you to all pay attention to this sentence. Everything in the unconscious seeks outward manifestation and the personality too desires to evolve out of its unconscious conditions and to experience itself as a whole. I cannot employ the language of science to trace this process of growth in myself. For I cannot experience myself as a scientific problem. What we are to our inward vision and what man appears to be subspecie eternitatis, that which means under the form of eternity, can only be expressed by way of myth. Myth is more individual and expresses life more precisely than the science. Science works with concepts of averages which are far too general to do justice to the subjective variety of an individual life. Thus, it is that I have now undertaken in my 83rd year to tell my personal myth. I can only make direct statements, only tell stories, whether or not the stories are true is not the problem. The only question is whether what I tell is my fable, my truth. So I brought to you some images from, this is, I don't know if I can, uh, you can see here the um, Jung's uh, house in Zurich. And here on top of the door, this is his study, on top of the door, there is a, a, an inscription in Latin, vocatus, attack, attack, non vocatus, Deus adderit, which means called or not called, God will be present. So Jung got the sentence from one of Erasmus de Rotterdam's writings, and it goes back to the Delphi Oracle in ancient Greece where people went in search for answers from the god Apollo. In a certain way, 
not that he would like it, I think. Maybe Lionel can tell us later. But we could say that Jung was kind of an oracle himself of the psyche, bringing us many new approaches to its study. Uh, so the study of the psyche and information about the structure and dynamics of, its, um, of this amazing and still much unexplored inner world. So these are some images from Zurich and Lake Zurich. And uh, here the Bollingen uh, Tower, a tower that Jung uh, built by the lake. It's a beautiful image. This is Jung by the lake. And uh, just a remind, a rem uh, it reminded me that one of Jung's grandsons said, that his grandfather was a sailor. Uh, and uh, we used to think that he's a very unusual one. Uh, in addition, because in addition to navigating the waters of the Zurich Lake, which he did constantly, reading out loud uh, Homer's um, Odyssey, uh, he took a deep dive into the waters of the unconscious, bringing to us much needed knowledge. So here are some, here are some images, um, Jung's mother and father, Jung as a child and Emma Jung and Jung as you know youngsters when they met. And this is uh, the Burgosley uh, psychiatry hospital, the biggest in Switzerland at that point, where Jung worked as a young psychiatrist. And this is a very well known image of Jung and Freud with Ferenzi. And when they went to Worcester in the United States in 1909 to give some lectures and talk about psychoanalysis. So Jung says that, oh, sorry, sorry, just go back. So an autobiography, uh, Fabrizio, can you help me? Because in the, the beginning, I cannot see the first line. Yeah. Um, Do you want me to read the, it? Are you listening? Do uh, you want um, me to read I, it, Fabrizio? Um, sorry. Fabricio? Yeah, I can read it. That's okay. An biography is so difficult to write because we possess no standards, no objective foundation from which to judge ourselves. I know that in many so things. Right. I... Sorry, it's a delay in the internet. <laughs> can you read the first sentence to me, please? An autobiography is so difficult to write. Thank you. Because we possess uh, no standards, no objective foundation from which to judge ourselves. I know that in many things I am not like others, but I do not know what I really am like. I am a man, but what is it to be that? Like every other being, I am a splinter of the infinite deity but I cannot contrast myself with any animal, any plant or any stone. Only a mythical being has a range greater than man's. How, they can, how then can a man form any definite op opinions about himself, he wonders. I will ask you to read again the first sentence because it's too up. Okay, we are a psych process which we do not control. So we are reading together, see, and that's collaborative work, mm -hmm. uh, or only partially direct. Consequently, we cannot have any final judgment about ourselves or our lives. Life has always seemed to me like a plant that lives on its rhizome. 
So its true life is invisible, hidden in the rhizome. The part that appears above ground lasts only a single summer. Yet I have never lost a sense of something that lives and endures beneath the eternal flux. What we see, what we see is blossom, which passes. The rhizome remains. So this is very important um, knowledge that Jung is bringing about, you know, what are we, what is man? What is, uh, what are we doing here? What, which part of us is visible and which is invisible and is hidden? So we are going to be back there in our discussion. But now I bring to you uh, a little of uh, Joana de Angelis. Uh, it's in the book, Life, Challenges and Solutions. And it's chapter four. And uh, when she talks about life energies. So this is all Joana de Angelis. So she's talking about mental habits. And she says, biological life in itself is the result of automatisms functioning in harmony as long as the organic equipment is in order. Obeying the heart rate and brain reactions, all phenomena appear repetitive, predictable within ancestral atavisms. So this is all Joanna's talking, okay? So this is uh, these are some stages of development that I brought to you reading Joanna. It uh, it came back into my mind, and it's the stages of the embryo evolution. Okay, in the mother's womb. So um, you can see there is. Let me go back. So Joanna is saying biological life in itself is the result of automatisms functioning in harmony as long as the organic equipment is in order. Obeying the heart rate and brain reactions, all phenomena appear repetitive, predictable within ancestral atavisms. Okay, so you see one of the things that we think while we are, you know, like a reptile in the embryo developing in the mother's womb, you see the different stages, one month, two months, three months, coming from fertilized egg, you know, when it's splitting to the nine month baby. So uh, I remember saying, uh, uh, when the first thought about that, listening, to Dr. Marlene Nobri, that she was one of the founders of the Medical Spiritist Association here in Brazil. And the first time, and I'd never thought about that exactly like this, but I remember she uh, telling us, see how the ont ont ontogeny, sorry, recapitulates um, phylogeny, okay? So which means, Ontogeny, we know that it's the development of our own organism, okay? So the development of our organism repeats our evolutionary history as a species, our phylogeny, right? Because we come, we know Darwin, everybody knows Darwin's theory. So uh, life develops on earth. Uh, we. Even we say that we have a reptile brain that is the basis of the brain, the part of the brain that it's in the basis. We call uh, some, some uh, neurologists call the reptile brain, the instinctive part, you know? So this is very important, I think, to, uh, to understand what Donna Jungel is saying. There are um, atavisms within ourselves, okay? within our uh, consciousness. So is th this is the baby in mother's womb. So imagine the complexity and how it 
just happens within our bodies, okay? And the brain and, of, of course, the heart. It's beautiful when we study anatomy, the ones that are from the medical field or the health uh, professionals. So Joanna says that subjected to mesological factors, okay, the relationship between uh, the environmental factors and uh, the beings. So subjected to mesological factors, such as food nutrients, for instance, in the first period of physical existence, it passes without alterations, marching inexorably towards the uh, fatality of its development. So the baby learning how to walk, you know, is one of other examples. Mental life, Joanna says, begins with glimpses and perceptions as the spirit so this pay very uh, much attention at this point, as the spirit takes over the equipment of the brain, which decodes the waves of thought. So for Joanna, it's very important that we understand that our consciousness is our spirit, okay? So it's part of our spirit. So mental life begins with glimpses and perceptions as the spirit takes over the equipment of the brain. The spirit is, the spirit is using the brain, not the brain is producing the mind. The spirit, the higher consciousness is using the brain, which decodes the waves of thought. So the brain will decode the waves of thought from the initial instinctual impulses to cosmic understanding. Don't we want to get there to the cosmic understanding and a wide experience. It opens the doors of communication to logical reasoning before reaching the superior stage, which is the identification with the divine consciousness. So she's telling us the evolution of the spirit, okay, of our higher consciousness. Uh, and she says that the spirits, the spirits here incarnated takes over the equipment of the brain to decode, and the brain decodes the waves of thought. And so from the initial instinctual impulses to going there where we want to go to cosmic understanding and a wide experience it opens the doors so the spirit little by little opens the door of communication to logical reasoning what we are doing right now before so we are in one stage of evolution of the logical reasoning but before we get to the point of reaching the superior stage, which is the identification with the divine consciousness. Okay, the human being victorious in the previous stages through which he has passed. So we are talking about reincarnations, many lives, uh, many learnings. When reaching the moment of reason, also brings the mental habits ingrained in the reflexes of the fixations of intellectual learning. They are the ones who start directing his conduct because all existential, uh, existential programming begins in the thought for Joanna. Okay? So, all those atavisms that we are saying for Joanna is in the thought, but um, in this existential programming uh, that helps us to evolve in many different ways from the beginning when we reincarnate and our body is growing and our mind is developing, developing uh, to intellectual reasoning and learning right, to different stages through that cosmic uh, perfection. Um, well, it, it, is, it is going to be a perfection, 
but to the the cosmic thinking. Uh, so they are the ones, right? This mental habits ingrained in the reflex and uh, reflexes of the fixations of intellectual learn, learning. They are the ones who start directing his conduct because all existential programming begins in the thought, for Juan. In the thought are the orders of what should be done and how to carry them out. As a result of previous experiences, thoughts of pain, anguish, pessimism were more deeply marked due to their unbalancing force. We are talking about the spirit, okay? It is these unconscious evocations that first attack the mental home when we reincarnate of the individual in his daily life. Linked to, the, linked to the repetitive mechanisms of suffering behaviors, he maintains tendencies towards masochism cultivating without realizing it, the mental habits that generate conflict and suffering, okay? So I brought to you a small, I don't know if I told this before, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but I don't think here I have told this. It's a very, um, it's an Eastern tale, very quick. That it's a man is on the side of the road. Always when I think about habits, I remember this story. A man is on the side of the road. Suddenly, a rider passes at great speed. The man asks, where are you going at such speed? The rider answers, I don't know, ask the horse. I don't think I have told you this small story. So the horse can be our habits. Okay, so I remember this when I was uh, reading again uh, Joanna's chapter. So allowing oneself to be led by primitive habitual manifestations, the labors that keep the being in the stage in which it finds itself are repeated without positive results, without the moral value to reach new levels of the process of evolution. Is if we allow ourselves to be led by primitive habitual manifestations. Since thought is the guideline for conduct, thinking correctly must be the great challenge for anyone who aspires triumph for Joanna. Then we can think of the Buddhists, right? They have the octopo um, pathway, the right thinking, the right saying, etc. So it is up to individual to insist and persevere opening new space in the addicted mental field, planting new seeds of optimism and hope in order to get out of the sick state. It is essential to start valuing everything around you, establishing new standards of understanding, thus freeing yourself from negative pessimistic constructions. The new habit will slowly implant itself in the subconscious until it becomes an integral part of the behavior. We can exchange some ideas about this with Lionel and other health professionals that, for instance, do psychotherapy, because it's one of the principles of psychotherapy, you know, um, some kind of, but all of psychotherapists try to bring uh, this uh, habit, this unconscious stuff to consciousness so that we can establish new standards of understanding. Then Joanna goes on, good or bad thinking for her is a matter of habit. You can think about that later on. Every time an unhealthy, perverse, malicious, unjust thought occurs, we should immediately replace it with a dignified, healthy, loving, trusting, fair one, sustaining it with the wave of irradiation of the desire that it be fulfilled. 
So you see how Joanna talks about mental stuff, but also at the same time about spiritual, uh, she uses spiritual language also, because when we talk about wave of irradiation, so we are talking about the ability of the spirit, uh, the spirit to irradiate a wave, okay, an, an energy of the desire that, um, you know, to sustain this better uh, or healthier way of thinking, dignify, healthy, loving, trusting, you know, and that this desire should be fulfilled by us. Uh, so she, she goes on saying that what we think becomes reality. This is why thinking and acting are terms for Joanna of the same existential equation. And so she says, first think, then act. Sometimes it's very hard and we are going to be learning together why, okay, with the Jung, some of Jung's concepts and, and uh, structures of the psych. So the superior mental constructions for Joanna which produce healthy habits are renewed and grow in the being originating from the spirit that captures them from the divine thought, from where all the forces of edification and total realization derive. I'm uh, thinking now about one of Lionel's books, but I don't want to give people spoilers uh, about the transpersonal uh, transpersonal dimension of the psych when he talks about that, just so he can have in his mind if he can make some connections about this sentence uh, that Joanna Johnson says and about the collective unconscious or the transpersonal dimension of the unconscious. The superior mental constructions which produce healthy habits are renewed and grow in the being originating from the spirit that captures them from the divine thought, from where, from where all the forces of edification and total realization derive. So the uh, psychologically healthy man or woman does not live on memories, nor is she or he tormented by aspirations. As thought is the source that generates aspirations for Joanna, yearning for the best and working to acquire it represents elevation and moral development. Not getting upset, she says, however, when this does not happen is a demonstration of maturity and balance. So coming to the end, more or less. So this um, this is all the intro introduction. So we can think about a little of what Jung was saying about himself using Jung, Jung psych as uh, an story as um, an example. And what Joanna is talking about mental habits. So for Jung in psychology, the personality as a whole is called psych, as a, a Greek wor uh, word that ori originally means spirit or soul in ancient Greece, and later came to mean mind. And in the psych, we include all thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, both those that uh, we perceive as conscious, uh, as well as those that are unconscious, in a very simple way, okay? This concept of the psyche represents Jung's early idea that a person is primarily, primarily a whole. What man has to do during his existence is to develop this essential whole until, reach, until he reaches the highest possible degree of coherence, differentiation, and harmony. Otherwise, man can break up into separate, autonomous, and conflicting systems, and a dissociated personality is an unhealthy personality. So in the model thought by Jung, the psych would be composed of several concentric spheres. We can think about that, like an onion, for example. 
The most superficial layer would represent consciousness, while the other scales would be the deepest levels of the unconscious until we would reach the center. Until we would reach the center. Among all these layers, there would be a constant interaction. So this we can find uh, in the internet. Uh, it's this author, Peter Freeman in 2014. I thought it was a good, uh, a good um, map, let's say, a diagram. So, and we are going to be seeing, okay, because we're going to be talking about all these uh, concepts. But so different uh, layers, and this is the ego, okay, and um, consciousness, we could say the outside layer, and the persona that is kind of conscious. We are going to be talking about one of the complexes related to the ego. And then in the personal unconscious, the shadow, another complex, it's kind of opposite to the persona. And then the center, the self, it's a beautiful concept, one of, uh, it's a Jung self. There are other authors that talk about self, but this is Jung concepts of, uh, concept of the self. Deep within the collective unconscious, and the archetypal level, okay? But you see that it uh, borders the personal unconscious because there is the ego uh, ex, uh, self axis. We are going to be talking about all of these concepts in our course. And this is a, more, a much simpler um, diagram that it's, okay, we have the consciousness, the outside layer, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious, looking very small, but uh, I don't think that it's kind of correct, the size of the thing, but we are going to be seeing all of this and discussing all of this later. So in the collective words, Jung says consciousness is a surface of shift covering the vast unconscious area, the extent of which is unknown. Okay, it's unknown, the extension of the unconscious. That's why it's so much bigger. So we restrict ourselves to the perception of instance of existence. It's like looking through a crack and only seeing a single moment of existence. It is difficult to us to have, a, you know, a consciousness is like a continuous that I know everything about myself from yesterday, from two days, from one week. Uh, it's a split, okay? So we have difficulty establishing an image of wholeness due to the very limitation of consciousness. So let's be humble, people. Uh, our conscious and consciousness is still limited, okay? So for Jung, the area of the unconscious is immense and continuous, but the area of consciousness is a restricted field of momentary vision. So just to remind us that the word consciousness comes from the Latin conscious, which means to know with other, to participate in knowledge, or just to know later on. So consciousness is the only part of the psyche known directly by the individual, forming from the unconscious, according to you. It appears early in life, probably before birth, and changes throughout life. The beginning of consciousness is also the beginning of individuation, a concept, a beautiful concept that we are going to be learning later on the course. It is the point of orientation and perception of the external world. Okay, so we need our consciousness to orient ourselves and, per, uh, and have this perception of the external world. And I brought to you this, I love many sentences, Jung sentence, brought to you this sentence where Jung says, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life. 
and you will call it fate. I think this is very important. And um, keep in mind this sentence because it's one of, I think, Joanna's uh, main objective. And also, um, of course, uh, Jung's, uh, all the, his development of analytical psychology that we call deep, depth psychology to bring the deep unconscious, not only our uh, personal unconscious, but the deep unconscious, unconscious as much as we can to have this talk uh, with our, um, well, our depths our inner being, okay? Uh, so that I don't give too much spoilers, uh, but to have this talk, to bring, to make the unconscious conscious as much as we can, because then we are uh, directing our life and um, we are not uh, subjected to what we call fate, okay? So I think I can stop the sharing. And I hope I didn't take too long because I very much want to um, listen to Lionel, some of his um, ideas and to everybody else. Uh, and I do invite everybody who is um, listening to this recording afterwards to join us in the next meeting so we can debate and exchange ideas together, okay? If possible and when possible. So I should say bye-bye to people that are um, listening to the recording. Uh, Fabrice, you want to say something? Um, are we going <coughs> to record Leonel's comments before we open to questions and answers or shall we stop the recording? No. Oh, that would that would be interesting. Would like Lionel to um, give some some of your thoughts so that people later could. Okay. Um. Well, she says that um, uh, we have to replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts, which is actually a kind of a cognitive behavioral approach to <laughs> to one's em emotional state. She also um stresses thinking a great deal she doesn't seem to take into account feelings which are just as important as thoughts so she i, I think she needs to have a few more conversations with Jung about this <laughs> <laughs> because some of these negative thoughts are coming from the the deep unconscious they're coming from complexes that the individual actually has no control over and that's why becoming conscious is so important it's 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 difficult to change a negative thought if it's if it's being influenced by material in the unconscious that you have no control over that that's my main comment about what she said um and i just uh give you that was my kind of fault yeah. Because Joanna de Angelis is uh, so, uh, she talks a lot about feelings and sensations. She does. But, okay. Yeah, and it would be too long for this meeting. Yeah. So I I kind of like, I knew we know each other very well that you would comment on this because, and I wanted to talk about the thoughts. We say in the Spiritist uh, knowledge that thoughts have all this uh power in, in the sense that have uh, our waves right and have all this energy but they are colored kind of we can use this image by feelings and emotions yes. so joanna talks about this too okay. but i i brought only a part of the you know her reasoning because i really wanted to like uh, have this talk and this challenge, Lionel, because cognitive behavior uh, therapy, uh, therapies and meditation, mindfulness, for instance, is so important in the medical field nowadays, as mm -hmm. you know, as a psychiatrist. And that's the way, for instance, meditation uh, is able to get into the hospitals and the psychiatrist training. But uh, they live 
the, the, this part of the, that Lionel were talking about the feelings and emotions, okay? Mm -hmm. So I will be bringing this later on when we talk about the complexes, because we have a different, um, uh, a different uh, classes to talk about things. So I wanted to make this on purpose, Lana, and I'm very glad that you talked about that and uh, is reminding people about feelings and emotion, because there is all everything to do with um, Jung's concept of the complexes, right? Mm -hmm. And Joanna talks about that. But I wanted everybody to go little by little, because nowadays it seems that either we are... Uh, you know, tormented, if we could say like that, about uh, feelings of rage or um, sometimes loving if people say thumbs up. Oh, I think it's so beautiful what you said and uh, I want to be your friend in the social media and all, all of that. But usually what we see in the social media, and I know because people tell me because I'm not in social media, <laughs> But what people keep complaining and our patients that uh, the, the rage in this debate and all this duality, and I have the reason and you are, uh, you know, and people are my enemy that don't agree with me. Uh, it's kind of contaminating, you know, the everybody. So uh, I think it's so nice that Lionel talks about that. Uh, because we are going to be, we have to go deeper. So it's not only the thoughts, mm -hmm. not only the mental habits in this sense, but also the uh, the feelings and the emotions that overcomes us sometimes. Uh, sorry, Lana, I just want to make this and say that it's um, her writings are very extant. Uh, so I wanted to go little by little. Go ahead, please. Uh, I also think that you could unpack a little when she says that what we think becomes reality. Um, that That's uh, not so easy to understand, but it seems to mean that we the, the our outer world seems to reflect our inner world. So, for example, if we have a lot of internal conflict and aggression, that we tend to evoke conflict and aggression in our relationships but so what's going on outwardly reflects the, the way our mind is put together i think that's what she meant by that it, otherwise it's a bit hard to understand what she meant no it was exactly that and um i really wanted you or uh, other people to but of course you to um, talk about that because otherwise would be, you know, like um, a determinism, if we could say that, oh, I have to pay a, a lot of attention to what I think because, and people get stressed and anxious about that, right? Because it, it could come as a reality. It is a psychic reality and we manifest in our behavior. That's what you are saying, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. But it's not, uh -huh. that's it. Uh, some more comments to the general public line now before we... Well, I just had one other comment, which which is that she makes it sound as if the spiritual dimension is only good and loving. And I think it's important to, for us to acknowledge Jung's idea that the spiritual dimension has its negative aspects as well. You know, that, that the divine has positive loving aspects, but also there's an aspect of it that causes suffering as well. So I don't think we should say it's only positive. I don't know whether that's what she thinks, but that's what it sounded like from what you read. Yeah, um, actually, again, this is what, uh, was just a part of uh, her talking about this subject. Mm -hmm. But um, she talks about a lot about uh, this dark dimension. We talk a lot about this dark dimension in um, spirit, uh, spiritist uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not the ultimate, you know, as you always say, uh, we don't know what's the ultimate uh, God. I mean, you know, the, the this cosmic intelligence or whatever people want to call, but about the dimension that we can relate to. 
then of course there is th this dark side too. And we are going to be talk a lot about that when you talk about the shadow and collective shadow. And But uh, Lano, I think it's very important when we talk about that uh, because Joanna uh, doesn't stress so much this dark side, mm -hmm. okay? And um, this is, uh, your point of view is kind of new. So uh -huh. I think it's it's going to be very interesting when we get to the self and to the dark side of the self. Thank you. Um, some more comments, Lano, to the general public? No, I think I'd like to hear what other people want to say now. Okay, so now I think we can stop sharing uh, recording. Okay, just before we do that, and I just want you to um, elaborate a little bit more because when you um, show the diagram, the diagram, maybe my understanding of my reading is incorrect. I just wanted to uh, clarify that for me. Does Joanna say that the collective unconscious and the self is the same thing? Or they are two different concepts there? Well, they are kind of, um, well, we are going to get, the, I didn't want to talk about the collective unconscious and the self because there are many people that are watching us that don't have uh, any idea about the collective unconscious and this. So I think we should, um, you know, uh, get put the uh, first have uh, some clarification about the concepts mm -hmm. and then we can see what she says what Jung says do you think it's okay for this are you going to be anxious I don't <laughs> want to give spoilers can I say something who is talking it's Conrad yes please if you don't mind being recorded no, no I don't care. I don't care about that. Um, uh, very good presentation. And being a medium from the spiritual uh, center in Campinas, in, in, in England at the moment, something sent me into a trance for two minutes. That's why I sat down on another chair. Uh, um, too short a time to say why. Uh, all I came out was good things about your presentation. Okay, good things. Uh, I can't. I can't say more than that because I don't know. Uh, 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 it's important, um, as the first person said. Is good and. Uh, good sides and bad sides of the entire story. So it's important to understand that. And pray for everyone, basically. Thank you, Conrad. So we, I'm gonna stop the record now so that we can Thank move you. on to the questions and answer, if that's okay with everybody. So I will stop the record now.